Good afternoon. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the uh, last official track session of the day before we visit the, uh, the bars that are about to open in the, the foyer. I'm Ben Feynman with Internet2, um, our program manager for video voice and collaboration. And it is my privilege today to moderate the panel session on building the metaverse. And we have some really great panelists that are joining us today. Um, just to, to start us out, I wanted to play a short video. And I, I debated whether or not to, to bring this video today. Um, it was actually something we made for internal distribution. But I figured last session of the day, we, we need a little something visual to uh, wake us up before we, we start the conversation. So without further ado, um, if we have the video. Virtual reality has long been a fascination of the human race. It will fundamentally change the way we collaborate and share information. Advances in head-mounted displays are driving a surge forward in the virtual reality space. This combined with cameras creates the opportunity for augmented reality, which will change the way we work and the way we play. But like the early web, deployments of virtual environments are siloed and isolated. Standards and protocols exist, but are not widely adopted or deployed. And unsolved problems exist in the areas of scalability, distributed architecture, and identity. The research and education community is uniquely positioned to address these issues while creating compelling content and applications. Solving these issues will enable the vision of the metaverse, a collection of shared virtual spaces that will change the way we use the internet. Together, our community can lead the implementation of this vision. So hopefully that can frame out the conversation a little bit. And those are you know, mostly my opinions, um, along with some folks in the community that helped me put that together. And I think we have a diverse set of opinions on what exactly the metaverse is and, and how to get there represented today. So I'm really excited to, uh, to talk about that. I'm going to start by uh, introducing our, our remote participants. We have a couple of, uh, couple of guys that are joining us on video. If we want to bring up the, the video conference on the side screens. Uh, I'm going to start with Josh Carpenter. Uh, actually, I'm not going to start with Josh Carpenter because uh, James is big on the screen right now. So I I'm going to start with James. This is James McRae, currently a postdoc fellow at the University of Toronto. And J James is the creator of um, an application called Janus VR, which is, well, he describes it as a spatial walk through the internet. And it's kind of a precursor to this metaverse concept. Um, and James has a Bachelor of Science from 2006, a Master of Science from 2008, and a Doctor of Philosophy most recently this year. Um, so the, the format we're going to do, I'm going to give each panelist two minutes for opening remarks or further introductions, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time doing a, a panel discussion. So James, any opening remarks for you? Uh, well, thanks very much. Very detailed. I won't take long to uh, uh, introduce myself. Um, but yeah, PhD, recent PhD grad at the University of Toronto. I'm the uh, founder of a company called FlatFab, which came from a chapter from my PhD work. And I wanted to show these 3D models in an easy way that I could share them. And kind of having this virtual museum on the web was how Janus VR got started, actually. So I'm the creator of Janus VR, which is this sort of ongoing experimental project, right? Combines sort of the latest virtual reality stuff with the 2D web as we know it, uh, making it, trying to make it into something more. So uh, thanks very much for having me. Wish I was there. Perfect. Uh, thanks. Thank you, James. And just acknowledging that we do, do have a little packet loss on James's connection. But I, I think it's appropriate, because it, ma it makes you sound a little bit like Max Headroom. So <laughs> I, I think it works for us. Um, so our, our, our other remote participant is Josh Carpenter. And Josh was the user experience lead for Firefox at Mozilla, and he's now focused on um, VR research at Mozilla, most notably implementing 
uh, 3D into Firefox. And Josh has spent his career focused on the intersection between digital design and the, the built environment is based out of San Francisco. So Josh, turning it over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm going to uh, ignore that echo. And actually, I'm kind of glad I'm not there in person because this is very meta, isn't it? Like to actually be coming into you remotely. Um, so I work on use the virtual reality team at Mozilla. I'm part of a two-person team. What we're trying to do essentially is, is, is figure out, um, it's great to bring the virtual web and the current web together and to figure out you know, what does that look like from user experience standpoint? What do we need to do from the platform standpoint that isn't actually done yet, it's not in place? Uh, and uh, uh, basically in, in doing this, what we've done in the last couple of months is release a series of APIs that enable anyone to actually create a virtual reality website that plays back in the browser. Uh, you know, no plugins, totally standards compliant. It essentially allows you as a web developer to talk to any HMDs that are connected to the actual browser uh, and take the information from those HMDs like sensor position, tracking position, and actually feed it into a, a camera system in your website. User hits full screen and now you're in a VR website. So super, super, super backwards compatible, um, really easy to use for developers. Uh, and right now what we're doing is creating experiments about you know, what are you going to do with this? You know, what does Wikipedia VR look like? Uh, what are the jobs that we're going to hire the VR web look like? What are they actually, you know, what's it good for? Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks very much. I was saying to James before this that uh, I think James and I are both probably pretty new to virtual reality, and uh, part of the excitement for me, part of the, the best part of my job is talking with people who come at it from the backgrounds as various visual effects, um, from academia, uh, from game design, and figuring out together what virtual reality and kind of what the metaverse is going to look like. So I'm super happy to be here today, and uh, just, just as a fan of, of, of the industry. Um, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. And uh, now moving to our in-person presenters. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we have Dr. Ted Castronova, who you may remember from the general session. Um, so I, I won't belabor his introduction other than to add that he's also the author of some books that are very relevant to this space. A, a couple main ones are Synthetic Worlds, The Business and Culture of Online Games, and Exodus to the Virtual World. Um, so recommend checking those out and turning it over to you for any opening remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me plug some more books. <laughs> Wildcat Currency came out this summer. It's about Bitcoin. Um, and that is a much younger me. Oh, I miss you so much. <laughs> uh, I, I can see myself down here. Um, yeah, I'm an economist, and so my interest in virtual reality extends beyond the physical. Uh, we're, we're learning how to instantiate physics and visuals and sound. Uh, I would like to go beyond that and instantiate virtual social spaces. You need the physical spaces first, but I think it's, a, it's a, an, another one of these wicked problems in this area is like, okay, now we have the buildings, how do we create the city? Perfect. No, well put. Um, sitting next to Dr. Kastanova is Margaret Delinsky, who is an associate professor and a senior research scientist and a fellow with the Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities at IU Bloomington. And she is one of our VR veterans. She's been working with VR since 1995. Um, and turning it over to you for any opening remarks. Hi, um, so I teach at the School of Fine Arts and I actually have a few of my students here in the audience. Cameron Buckley, Daniel Smith, and Yushan are here and they're showing the Oculus Rift uh, in the demonstration booth, so I hope that you'll visit them and see the Oculus in action with them. I teach art experiences in virtual reality. I'm interested in collaborative virtual reality. I've used the internet too, as well as the international grid to share art environments. Um, we've done collaborations with up to seven different countries at one time, including the United States, Austria, Hungary, Sweden, Yokohama, and others. I'm really interested in consciousness and situating consciousness in virtual worlds and the experience that occurs when you're engaged with them. Perfect, thank you. And just reiterating our thanks to um, Margaret's students who are helping us out a great deal by giving the, uh, the virtual reality demonstrations on the Oculus Rift in the demo hall. So if you haven't checked that out, I recommend doing so. 
Um, and finally, we have Bill Sherman, who is another VR veteran. Bill is the senior technology advisor at the IU Bloomington Advanced Visualization Lab. And Bill's been working with VR since 1991. Uh, and Bill has also authored a couple of books on the topic, Understanding Virtual Reality and Developing VR Applications. So Bill, any comments? Right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, strikes me the most about this year in particular and, th and having this panel at this conference is that it, this is really exciting times for virtual reality. As Ben said, I've been doing virtual reality work for about 23 years. And uh, you know, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. Gartner has this graph of how tech new technologies come on the scene and then they have kind of these instant uh, inflated expectations. Uh, when those aren't met, it kind of droops a bit. And then eventually, if, if people, people persevere with the technology, it kind of grows back into, into, its own, uh, into its own realm and where it kind of belongs. We're now experiencing another spike. I don't know if this is going to be like a second spike of overinflated expectations, but uh, the, the fact that uh, Facebook bought you know, this Oculus Rift, Oculus VR company uh, this year for $2 billion really kind of put VR back back on the scene, and this year's uh, computer graphics conference was, was really a buzz with virtual reality, whereas it had really died out over the past decade or so. Um, a lot of my work has been in more in the kind of the walk-in virtual reality displays, the cave style displays, if you're familiar with virtual reality. And we find that those work, I, most of my work's been with uh, scientists and a few training applications, rather than say home-based applications or um, uh, kind of gaming things. but. Uh, uh, for a long time, we've been kind of riding the coattails of games, you know, with the graphics cards. Uh, now we're starting to ride the coattails of games, I think, with the head-mount display technology. So I think we'll see some movement in that direction, although, you know, a lot of scientists will still want to use the kind of big screen displays. Um, you know, and one of the things I, I kind of like to talk, in one of my books we talk about what's the purpose of virtual reality versus other systems. And, you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes is really uh, uh, one of the you know, kind of fascinating opportunities you have with virtual reality, and maybe we'll talk about that when we uh, get to the panel discussion. Oh, I also brought, I brought kind of the, the competitor to uh, Oculus Rift. I brought a Google Cardboard display. So you just take your phone and you put it in this display, and okay, your phone costs a few hundred dollars, but uh, it, since you already have one, you really now, it, it's at the point where just about anybody who already carries a smartphone can do virtual reality, and uh, that's basically it. Yeah, I was, you just put it in here and hold it up to your face, and you can see the virtual reality world. I can show it to people if they're interested afterwards. Perfect. Thanks, Bill. So without further ado, we're going to start some panel discussion. And I'm going to sit at this table with you guys so I can feel like I'm part of the team. Um, so first question, how, what, what does the concept of the metaverse mean to you? I kind of framed out my opinion in that video, but interested in hearing, hearing your opinions. Do you, do you want us to go in order? Or, no. Or? Unless, you want to start, you're welcome to, but you don't have to go okay, in order. Well, I guess I already <laughs> talked. So I, just, I mean, you know, we get it from novels, and I, it's, it's interesting, or, or like movies like The Matrix, you know, it's this concept that it's an alternate physical and social reality. Um, and it's kind of, you know, the physical and the social are, for me, are, are hard to keep in sync. So when I think of the metaverse, that's, that's, the, that's kind of how I see the problem space. Okay. So uh, uh, one of the places where I've, we're kind of, you know, kind of, again, talking from the technology point of view, uh, we have some collaborators who are using, you know, Connect. Everyone, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Connect, where it, it basically is a system that connect, uh, create, captures a point cloud. And so it captures kind of this semi-realistic representation of a real world that, that you can then transmit somewhere else. And there's a research uh, community that we work with or collaborate with sometimes uh, in Germany who actually have it so you can go from cave to cave, virtual reality display to virtual reality display. Uh, and you can, say, visit a castle. They have a video where you visit a castle. You can capture things. You can walk around with someone who's not really there but see them represented live as a 3D point cloud. Uh, we actually did a little experiment on this uh, last week to. Uh, to kind of give a remote talk, much like we're using the remote technology this week. And it's still, still some work to go, but uh, it's moving forward. Good. Yeah, I think those Connect applications especially are, are interesting because it enables the user to put their, their real world body into the virtual environment. So it'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Any comments from our uh, remote folks? Um, sure. Uh, all right. So. I think of the metaverse, of course, I think of the sci-fi inspired 
vision we have of it, uh, you know, books like the Snow Crash and things like this. But I also think of it in terms of reducing it to the, the core elements, whatever they may be. There's this notion of spaces. Uh, presently, the 2D web, they're 2D, but they could be 3D. So the, like, the embedding of data in space. Second is uh, the, the interconnection or the topology, how will these connect together? Um, there's this notion of freedom of creation, where anyone can make their own spaces. Um, collaboration, but in a large scale sense. So you have a single world versus instances. So if you're in a physical place, and someone else is too, you'll, you'll see them. Uh, the general feeling of being within it, as opposed to looking at it on a monitor, you're kind of within and you're able to look around and be inside. And then finally, there's this sense of identity that you, you carry with you, and that might be contextual based on your location. Um, but a bunch of those elements. And in fact, you know, the 2D web's already promising because it already has many of these elements, you know, the 2D spaces, some notion of connectivity, the ability to collaborate. And uh, I think now's a really promising time to, um, you know, add on to that with the advent of affordable VR HMDs, widespread, widely adopted and available. Um, turning things from less of a laboratory experiment rather to something that the greater population can use. So, it's exciting times. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And I, I'll go. <clears throat> oh, <hey. clears throat> so I think it was Edward who said that it's really the realization of the original idea. I show a slide when I do presentations on this stuff that shows uh, like the cover of Snow Crash, the cover of Neuromancer, and the cover of Ready Player One. It says something to me that when in human history there is an idea uh, that really grabs us, that we don't let it go. I mean, look at how long it took us to do a human flight. Like, there was just something so inherently appealing about it that we never forgot about it. And it kind of suffused itself through pop culture for 30 years, even while we built out most of what we need to actually do the metaverse. You know, another thing we talk about is, uh, you know, if you think of the metaverse as being a pyramid, we've kind of built the bottom 90%, moving the whole global economy onto a distributed infrastructure that is the internet, and moving people's lives onto that, into that infrastructure, that was the hard part. You know, the 10% that we need to do on top of that, of virtual reality, is relatively easy, actually. And I can tell you, on, at Mozilla, with these APIs, we're finding it pretty easy to get this stuff done. So this is the realization of the original idea, I think. Um, I also got to point out, from an interaction design standpoint, that this feels of a piece to me um, uh, consistent with what we're seeing in technology elsewhere, which is uh, technology going from being uh, very, very, very um, unhuman, shall we say, in its form factor and the ergonomics of use, and over a hundred years becoming smaller, more intimately uh, human, more recognizably uh, easy, to un easy to understand to pick up and use, whether it's the iPad, whether it's wearables, or whether it's virtual or whether it's virtual reality, the ability to kind of integrate with the technology that we use in a very human way, where you can't really tell necessarily pretty soon where the human ends and where the technology actually begins. Uh, and then, uh, you know, third, I would say, um, I think the metaverse to me is the jobs that we hire the web to do combined with the powers of virtual reality. You know, it's not going to be a bunch of floating flat planes. That would be a failure of imagination. It'll be the things that you sit down at your browser to do every single day, whether it's titillation, procrastination, you know, chatting with a loved one, et cetera, et cetera, combined with the powers of virtual reality. So it won't look like the classic web. It may in some places, but it can be so much more. So I encourage designers and creatives and developers when I talk to them to really think about those it, it, think about it through, it through that lens. Jobs we hire the web to do combined with the powers of virtual reality. So one of the things you said was that we, we have 90% of what we need to achieve this kind of uh, far-reaching sci-fi vision. And so I guess my question is, what, what is that last 10% and, and why haven't we achieved it yet? One of the things that I think is really important about VR is perception and shifting perceptions. The technology offers stereo vision, stereo audio, and plugs us into these metaverses, but it's the visitors' movements and it's the visitors' connections with the environments that really increases the sense of immersion. Once we get design those environments, it's the visitors that actually realize it through their own movements and their own connections to it. So I think that the challenge now is to create the metaphors that will keep people in those environments and keep people engaged. I don't think that the technology will reach its full potential without the use of really elegant creativity. Yeah, I think that's a great point, especially in terms of the, the current state of user interfaces. I mean, in, uh, in James's Janus VR application, 
he, he does what I, I think is the best possible solution today is by using a, uh, an Xbox controller and having that as the primary supported interface method to, to move your virtual self around in this 3D web environment. But, of course, th this, is, this is not a natural way to interact. So I certainly agree with your comment that we, we need more elegant interaction mechanisms before we can really see ubiquitous adoption. I, I'm in, interested to pull a little bit more on the, um, the architectural thread. Um, do, do we think we have everything we need in the current architecture of the World Wide Web to create this or layer this 3D metaverse environment on top of it? Or are there still missing components and unsolved challenges? Speed, connectivity. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, it's kind of an extension to what's been done with Second Life and, and other virtual spaces like that, except just adding on the user interface to it quite a bit. And, you know, with uh, how you interact with the 3D space, uh, you know, whether it's the Xbox controller or some other natural thing, but more, mostly it's the head tracking. But the head tracking is really kind of the missing piece that Second Life doesn't have. And with the Oculus Rift and, and with, you know, the sensors that are in your phones, it's kind of, you know, I mean, we're really getting close to closing that gap, I think. I think the reference to Second Life is illustrative because one of the features of Second Life was its emptiness. In other words, you know, you created this environment where anybody could make anything and it was immersive and, you know, you know approaching what we thought of as the metaverse. And there was a period in 2004, 2005 where we thought maybe this is it, you know, everybody's going to go into Second Life. But instead they went off to Facebook. And it's, it's you know, the question is what's the application? You know, if, even if you made it completely, you know, if I could just get into the metaverse by just going like that with my pen and then I was there, what, what do you do there? <laughs> we have a colleague at Indiana, that Bill and I were talking about, Margaret, I know you know, Bernie Frischer has made a beautiful Hadrian's Villa, a perfect recreation of Hadrian's Villa. But we're now working on a grant with NSF, like students go into Hadrian's Villa, this architectural, uh, archeological masterpiece, recreation to millimeter detail of an environment. And the students go in and they're like, what do we do? <laughs> so so I, I think that, to me, that's how I envision the tip of the pyramid, is the figuring out what do we do part. And uh, once that gets figured out, then uh, Katie bought the door. Right, so my kids are frequently found playing uh, 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 Minecraft these days, right? They didn't do yeah. Second Life, they're too yeah. young for Second that's Life. That's right. Minecraft is, you know, I, I feel, you know, I mean, that's kind of the area I'm in is computer graphics, but. I usually feel like I should push them more towards Lego, and they do do Legos as well, but if they're just sitting in the car, it's like all they want to do is Minecraft, Minecraft all the time, and build worlds. Yeah, and I, we talk, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. When I talk to this, when I talk about this with other people outside Mozilla, I talk about Minecraft a lot, and I'm like, you know, you, if you tried to design the audience for virtual reality, if you tried to create it, you couldn't have come up with anything but the Minecraft. You got 100 million registered users creating virtual worlds collaboratively with their friends. Like, get out of here. I mean, that sounds like the dream uh, user base for virtual reality. So I think we're very lucky in that regard. Um, you know, some hard constraints right now in the metaverse are latency of the browser stack. We do a lot of things in browser render engines that actually uh, add latency to the, to the render time, motion to photon uh, render time. Uh, we can do some fast pass around that, but we've got to do it. It's going to take us about six months to a year to actually get that done. So right now, latency is just not quite good enough to be where it needs to be to actually use these things for prolonged periods. Um, APIs for displays and control. Uh, the industry is moving so fast that it's difficult for us to design APIs that are going to be future friendly. We're having to kind of hedge our bets a lot, even on the interaction design side. Like I, as a designer of a, let's say, a user agent of VR, I don't know what the thing driving the cursor is going to be. So I have to kind of build abstractions into my design that say, like, well, there will be a cursor, but I can't tell if the cursor will be driven by a gamepad or a sensor or something else. Uh, and then lastly, I point out is render power. Um, render power to drive these kind of worlds. Uh, you know, the web is, the thing that makes the web the web is that backwards compatibility and the fact it can run on any device. So how do we ensure that the experience that you see on your, you know, your Pentium 4 is as good as what I see on my Mac Pro? How do we do that? Um, and I would suggest that I think the way this will be architected is we have most of the pieces lying around. We just need to repurpose them into being virtual reality pieces. So for example, very briefly, um, Otoy is, is a distributed rendering platform. Um, and what they're working on is putting all their render engine power into Amazon E3, uh, uh, Amazon Cloud Rendering Instances. 
and being able to actually do all the rendering on the fly and pipe it down to you using some new standards they're developing. So I think that you know that, that existed before in the games world with uh, something called On Live and other standards. I think that's a small example of where we'll see companies rise to the challenge of taking existing standards, existing solutions, and adopting them to, to the metaverse. So, uh, uh, oh, so no, go ahead, James, go ahead. Oh, just to, to comment further uh, from both perspectives. One, what are the applications? It's, it's a good point too. I'm kind of a believer that if you kind of enable, you know, if you get the technology in place and you make things easy, you know, it's easy, it, things are easy to work with, the tools are easy to use, that those applications kind of will emerge naturally sort of through the community. So as it is now with Janus VR, my own software, there's a community of users who are already finding applications for their own, like whether they're making an art gallery to show artists that it works, or they want to make like a video game like room, play like tennis or something, um, all the way from a, a business sort of front page, if you will, but in VR, that uh, you know can also showcase and demonstrate their projects, especially if there's 3D ge geometric assets that they want to show. So I'm actually surprised every time I kind of go into my client, run around and check it, these new applications that I, you know, I didn't originally anticipate or, or think of, and instead, you know, you're humbly surprised by the uses that you find. Uh, on the subject of technological limitations and issues, one of the things I'm contending now with is this, uh, I guess, I guess the notion is persistent of data. The idea that, like in a Minecraft world, you can jump on that server, you can kind of, you know, hit the blocks, make your mark on the world, and if you go away, someone wanders in later, they'll see that. Whereas like sort of the original HTTP, you know, web doesn't have this kind of thing. Like it's the same page served each time for everyone. And if you want to add dynamics to it, make a change, you have to put extra work into it, you know, add comments and things like this, or however it works. But there's extra machinery involved that will be either be on the server end or something that's going to require careful consideration. And, and uh, you know, there will be some sort of extension that will enable this additional interaction that persists to take place. So something I think about a lot, actually. So it's like a wiki, I mean, kind of the wiki concept. When you visit it, you make changes, and then you leave it that way when you... Uh, precisely, reverse. yeah. Yeah, something like that, yeah. So how do you, what, what would be the general platform or tech, technological base? So for instance, right now, the Janus server was written by uh, someone named Lisa Croxford, someone in the community. She wrote the Janus server code, which is open source, and it's no .js, so... Uh, you know, most people have a web server out there. They can, you know, run, you know, some some no budget program, and then now you have the Janus multiplayer there if you want it. But how do you extend that further to add the exactly the wiki sense or the the idea that you can mark it? Not only mark it, but if I'm there, you're there. When I'm marking it, you see that change at the same time. So there's like persistence, but then there's also broadcasting changes. How's all that managed? And how do you do it at a large scale? So there's a lot of interesting. Uh, technological considerations and unsolved problems there, I think. Yeah. Well, it's Sorry interesting. No, that's good. And so, yeah, the, the wiki concept is interesting. Maybe we have the, the name wrong. It's not the metaverse, it's the wikiverse. But I, I wanted to, to pull on the, the application thread a little bit more. So James mentioned a, a few uses that he's, he's seeing people um, use the, the metaverse concept for in Janus VR. Um, and as Dr. Castronova pointed out, you know, this won't really take off until there's good use cases. So what do we imagine are some of the use cases that people will find with this kind of technology? Or what use cases are, are you already seeing? Well, uh, I would like to ask, actually ask Mark. <laughs> that, you saying that gives me a question, which is, um, are we at the limits of reality? In other words, are, are we, have we getting to the point where merely, you know, rendering things in a, in a realistic way is, it isn't going to attract people that much? Are we, are we, you know, do we have to kind of go beyond that? I think that we're ready for the artists to come in. I really do. I think that the challenge was to be able to do photorealism, to make sense of it, to have people go through these environments and know where they were at. And I think it's time for the artists to kind of turn everything on its head and, and really do some really cool and neat things and, and challenge people's perceptions and to build new metaphors and to situate people in spaces that cannot be situated in a 3D world. You know, we're always writing on paper, we're thinking in 2D, we're reading. Now that we have 3D environments, how do we 
extend those metaphors and, and actually create um, hypervisions. I think that's really the challenge. So one application that you know, comes to my mind, I uh, forward alluded to it earlier, is uh, an artistic application done in the mid-90s uh, by, by an artist. And uh, what she had suffered a, a, a car accident and suffered a brain injury as part of that car accident. And once her body had physically healed with, you know, with respect to her motor uh, and her you know, bones and, and other parts of the body, she still had this brain injury to contend with, but people saw that she had physically healed externally. And so she had a hard time to convey, conveying to people you know, the difficulties that she was still experiencing. She would be walking down the hall and be very dizzy just from the pattern in the carpet. Uh, so she created a virtual reality space, teamed up with uh, uh, the Electronic Visualization Lab in uh, Chicago, and created a space where people could kind of experience from her perspective. You would put on the glasses, and you would walk down a hall and things would swirl around and then you had, had a much better sense for what it was like to you know, live with her new ocular uh, disorders that you know, were the result of this accident. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, oh, sorry, there's an agency going on here, but uh, in, in terms of potential applications in the future, uh, definitely artistic, yeah. There, there should, we should definitely see a lot more there, and that would be fantastic. But there are, you know, there's, there's potential uh, business opportunities there. Uh, one case, an example, and, and it's probably been tried before, but would be, you know, virtual e-commerce. And, and I'm sure some of the other panelists could comment further on, on this. But it's the case that you know, if you have a mall or something, and, you know, which is a significant investment in the, in the real world. Um, you, you kind of want to protect that, and the problem that they have is someone goes into the store, the physical world, tries out the item, and then they go home and they order it on Amazon or something. So uh, how do you how do you, maybe how do you prevent something like that? Maybe something like a virtual mall where you can actually go in and see the good and you know have a sense of it, or you know have it the clothes on some sort of virtual model or something, uh, and then actually be able to do the transaction there, sort of you know within the VR space, you know at that competitive web price or whatever. Uh, so I think there's, there's opportunities for, uh, you know, revolutionizing how maybe business is done and how businesses actually represent themselves uh, in sort of the direction of commerce, so. And I think one that's thing it. I'd throw out there as we, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, one thing I would throw out there as we think about <clears throat> um, the role of the metaverse is it, it reminds me of the debates we've had in the browser side about the role of the browser versus applications. I'm going to suggest that the apps that you actually hire the metaverse to do, the things that you do with it, will be very much a function of what the operating system that the metaverse is actually running on is. So for example, if the metaverse enables you to go between virtual VR experiences and to step into other worlds and, and have amazing gaming experiences and to, uh, to be educated, well, you're competing directly with whatever the other applications on that operating system are. Imagine that you boot into your Oculus OS and there's a bunch of icons. Like, Why do you tap on the metaverse icon? It can't be, we can't be competing two heads on with the installable experiences that are out there. We have to kind of find what the metaverse is uniquely good at if the metaverse is indeed built in the infrastructure of the web and has web-like ergonomics and hone in on those kind of applications um, and then leave the installables, let's say like the AAA gaming titles from EA, um, those might be left to the actual operating system as like an EXC that installs on your, on your Android device or whatever the equivalent is for Android. Um, so, you know, it could be that what the metaverse is really good at is kind of these, these kind of almost Janus style interconnected streamed experiences where you can take the inherent transparency of web content, the ability to actually target with a URL any individual asset and do these kind of crazy mashups. Um, or it could be transient content. I taught motion graphics for a very long time. I've got a bunch of students who are in some very good design agencies around the world doing motion graphics and, and like let's say music video experiences. Um, I don't want to install a music video. That's ridiculous. It's a kind of a transient piece of bite-sized content. Uh, but I would love to see that music video and step into that music video if it was a virtual world. So perhaps it's also like transient, small, bite-sized, mashup kind of pieces of content um, that the metaverse specializes in. I would kind of encourage anyone who wants to become be someone who's building the metaverse to think along these lines, to think about what's uniquely good about the web, uh, and not just try and be very wary about trying to take on the operating system head to head. Because I can tell you, as a browser vendor, we found that doesn't work very well. Can I uh, just? Uh, I really like the point that Josh made about there's going to be an icon, a tappable thing, and it's going to say metaverse or something like that. And you got to ask yourself, why do people want to click on that? And you know. 
I'll pitch my book again. No, this Exodus from, to the Virtual World book was really about that. And what I tried to do is look in human history, why did people migrate? Why do people migrate? And I view this as a, a form of migration that's very similar to what's happened before, with, but very, very different. And the main difference is that people can instantly travel, right? In a second, they can leave here and go to some other social and physical environment, in a second, with other people. And um, so I, this is kind of a cynical view, but one of the conclusions I came to there is if you really want people to adopt VR, you should make the real world even worse than it is already. <laughs> Right? Because one of the things that drives people to spend 80 hours a week in games, it's not, they're always, you know, explained, well, this person has a personality difficulty or they're addicted and all this. A lot of times it's because the world in which they live is not a very nice world. And in this kind of an audience at these kind of conferences, most people out there are like, my world is actually pretty good. I can't see myself spending that amount of time in a VR environment. But, you know, next time you're on a plane, look at the size of the neighborhoods that you're flying over as you're landing and ask yourself, you know, if somebody's sitting there saying, I can be a Starbucks worker or a Starship captain, and they choose Starship captain, I don't think any of us can blame them, right? And so to me, you know, those kinds of applications are really what's driving this migration. This, there, yes, there's productivity and there's usability and those sorts of things, but there's also something that's missing in terms of human meaning that somehow these games are able to satisfy. And I'm not saying that's great, that's actually not very great, but you know, <laughs> those are the kind of applications that seem to have the most success. Interesting. So was it, was it Snow Crash that the hero protagonist lived in a storage locker basically, right? Yeah, that's sort of, yeah. <laughs> we're not that far from that. Yep. So I, I know we're uh, running to the end of our time. Um, we've, we've just touched on a lot of really deep topics and that's the reason that our community is starting the, the Metaverse Working Group to continue this conversation um, with the specific goal of implementing examples of, of this concept at our institutions. But I, I just want to go around and give, give each panelist uh, 30 seconds for any closing comments. And Ted, you go first because you're- Oh, okay. Uh, the, the big wrap up that I get from this is that the technology is, is continuing to scream ahead. And, and so there's really, really exciting stuff that's gonna be happening. And the thing is, we don't know exactly what, but I, I there's gonna be a revolution, a social kind of change that's gonna come out of this area. Great, Margaret? I think it's gonna be wonderful when people will be able to develop for these systems much more easily, that they'll be more affordable, and that we can share our own imaginations more readily. Mm. Right, and one of the things that's been holding us back, I think, has really been the technology has been mostly with us, the VR researchers, and not with the audience, the users. And so I think, you know, this uh, democratization, everybody with using the smartphones or even at home, if you have a 3D TV, which are, you know, easy commodities to have, a webcam tracker, you can do wall kind of VR displays. Um, and I was just going to, I'm hoping that one of, that Josh or James, I don't remember who it was, but when in our phone call leading up to this mentioned the two camps, the... Uh, the uh, camp of old timers and the camp of people kind of scouting ahead, you know, bar the doors. I hope that they will bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I think it's both of us, uh, yeah. Yeah, James, yeah. You're, you're big on the screen now, so you can go next. Uh, just closing remarks. Um, first of all, just a big thanks to the community people who are already uh, using Janus and give lots of feedback, building these worlds and I'm really happy to be working on Janus VR because it's super rapid, fast development, purely creative, a little bit standard to be damned. I just kind of wanted to go for my vision of the metaverse and realize it's here and now and see just you know, how good can I make it just with the bare essentials and then build it from there. So I just want to say thanks and if you haven't tried it, check it out. And I'm, yeah, I'm happy working on this into the future and I think it's a great time to be. So thanks. Great, and we are demoing Janus VR on the uh, Oculus Rifts in the demo hall upstairs if you want to check it out. And Josh, I'll let you close this out. Yeah, thanks guys, thanks for having me today. Um, I'd say this, like, there's, there's this notion that, uh, you know, there's, you get kind of a technological determinism that uh, the metaverse will just happen, and it will just happen in an open and happy kind of way. Um, it'll be what we make it, you know, that we don't, shouldn't take anything for granted. If we want it to be open, if we want it to be, if we want uh, use of privacy and security to be respected, we have to make that happen. 
Uh, and frankly, it's a lot of fun. So I tell my coworkers here who work on desktop and, and mobile, as I did for many years, that uh, you know it feels a bit like the gold rush, and uh, half of your pioneering party may die of dysentery, but uh, if you live, someday they may name a street after you. So it's a, it's a pretty fun time to be in virtual reality, uh, and I highly recommend anyone out there who's listening or watching this later on to go get these tools, get Janus, uh, get, the, get the browsers that we're putting out there, and just start hacking, have fun, and uh, help build this. Great, thanks Josh, and thank you to all of our panelists. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we have our, our first meeting of the Metaverse Working Group on Wednesday over the lunch hour, so I encourage you to join us there, as well as checking out the, uh, the VR demos up in the uh, demo hall. So big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.